So can you go ahead and say and spell your name for us? Uh, my name is Carly Smith, C-A-R-L-I-S-M-I-T-H. And you're the? I'm the head brewer at Bold Missy Brewery. Awesome. Well, today is Thursday, June 14th, 2018, and we're at Bold Missy Brewery in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so Carly, can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your hometown and where you're from? I'm from uh, Poway, California, which is a small suburb of San Diego, California. Um, I was born and raised there. I uh, went to college there. I went to the University of San Diego, and I got my degree in accounting and finance and now I make beer. <laughs> well, that's an interesting transition. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you first got involved in brewing beer? Yeah, uh, while I was going to school, um, I just started, I wor started working at a brew pub. Uh, I started as a hostess there when I was 16. Um, and I was, I worked there for a few years. And then at one point while I was in school, I, our brewer was in between assistants and I remember being at an all staff meeting and he basically just said to all of us like hosts, servers, bartenders, you know, if anybody wants to come hang out and, you know, schlep grain around. And the only thing about it was, is it was at 530 in the morning. And so for me, I had done crew in high school and college and I was used to, so I was used to the early mornings and I had just quit crew and I was like, well, I got nothing else to do on Tuesday, Thursday morning. It's extra hours and you know, whatever, it could be fun. So I started helping him and I did that on a just kind of fun, unofficial basis for about six months. And then I really started getting into it, started reading some books on my own free time and really started kind of trying different things. Um, I studied abroad in uh, Austria um, I did Salzburg and then I also did Vienna and I really started getting into it over there because it was really cool each little neighborhood had their own local brewery so all of the bars and pubs in those and restaurants in those areas would have you know they'd have big beers but then they'd have their one local neighborhood beer and I thought that was just such a cool thing and so then when I came back finished my degree because my parents would have killed me <laughs> if I didn't finish my degree so then uh, once I graduated, I remember being at one of the biggest beer festivals in San Diego every year is the San Diego Brewers Guild Festival that goes on during uh, San Diego Craft Beer Week. And I remember we were walking around and we were talking to everybody and because I started to get to know everybody in the industry by that point, I'd been working events with the brewer and everybody was like, oh, Carly, now that you've graduated, like, what are you going to do in beer? And I was just like, uh, and then like, as soon as that, I just didn't even get to put a sentence out. Our brewer would just be like, oh, no, no, no. She's going to be a CPA. She's going to be an accountant. I was like, Doug, would you, the brewer was named Doug Hasker. Uh, I was like, Doug, would you stop telling people I'm going to be an accountant? Like, what if I wanted to be a brewer? He's like, oh, do you want to be a brewer? I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. So then he was like, okay, well, we talked to corporate about getting a budget for me to become officially his assistant. Um, I became his official assistant for about a year. Uh, and then I moved over and was the assistant brewer for Rock Bottom, which is a like sister company in our like umbrella of brew pubs. Um, it was a smaller system, so I wanted to kind of learn a little bit smaller, less automatic and more manual. Mm -hmm. And then, and what was the name of the uh, initial uh, brewery? So pub? the first brewery that I was assistant brewer was Gordon Biersch Brewery um, in. Uh, in San Diego and then I moved over to Rock Bottom Brewery in San Diego. Um, I went from Gordon Beers had a 25 barrel system and then I moved over to Rock Bottom which had an eight barrel system so it was a lot smaller a lot more manual um, and kind of the my learning curve had exponential growth when I moved on to a smaller more manual system. Um, I was the assistant brewer for Rock Bottom under Marty Mendiola for a year and a half um, before he left to open up his own company, his own brewery, and I took over for him over there. I was the head brewer over there for three years uh, before coming to Bull Missy. And how did you, you know, it's a long way from San Diego to here. A little here. bit. Um, uh, how did you even find out about this place? Um, they kind of found me. 
Um, I have one of my really good friends from middle school and high school that I kind of grew up with. She moved out here about six years ago and coming from like a native Southern California person, North Carolina is such a foreign concept. Uh, I had really no idea what North Carolina was even like. My friend told me, she's like, yeah, I'm moving to Charlotte. I was like, you're moving where? What? Um, and so I came out, I finally came out. She's been out here for about six years. I finally came out to visit her last year and I was just blown away by the trees. <laughs> Everybody always laughs at me because anytime I'm doing anything, I'm driving anywhere, anytime I don't have to like be focusing on the road and I'm driving somewhere, we're in the car driving somewhere, I'm like, but guys, look at all these trees. Like California, like I am a California tree hugger. Like we don't, we just don't have the trees that you guys have out here and the greenery and everything. It's just, so I was blown away by that. I really liked all the people that I met out here. I met some of the people in the beer industry. Um, and I was just like, oh wow, I'm like I could I could live out here, like because before I was just like North Carolina, I don't know. Um, so then my friend came to an event that they were having. It was women in marketing um, at they were they were having at Bull Missy, and they were talking about how they were still looking for a female brewer. And my friend was just like, oh well, I have a friend that I've been trying to get to move out here. He was like maybe you guys can get her out here. <laughs> and then yeah, and then we started talking and like. Six, less than six months later, I was here. <laughs> wow. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, you talked a little bit about the trees, mm -hmm. which yes. having lived in Texas for a little bit and mm -hmm. then coming back to North Carolina, you forget like how yeah. different it just oh my looks. Gosh, it's crazy. But um, can you talk a bit about the differences in the beer scene and the beer yeah. culture between the San Diego mm -hmm. West Coast and here? Oh, for sure. Uh, well, definitely the haze craze has taken hold out here a lot well faster because it's the proximity to you know the New England Northeast um, but also um, I think we're kind of dragging our feet well I keep I'm still trying to work out the we I'm not no longer part of the West Coast anymore <laughs> but I feel like the West Coast is kind of dragging their feet on it on really kind of buying into the whole uh, hazy IPA thing because you know West Coast is so ingrained in our the way that we brew and do things um, that's one of the things um, I think hmm it's just different one of the things that I've noticed about Charlotte specifically I don't have a ton of experience um, like outside of the Charlotte market, mm -hmm. um, but I've noticed that a lot of times people aren't really interested in the kind of core, like having their like their old faithful. Everybody's always looking for what's new, what's different, like what are you releasing this week? I had what you released last week, but now I want to know what you're releasing this week. And that kind of thing where I, you know, I'm used to back at home, one of my favorite beers is Alesmith X. It's an extra pale ale. It's delicious. I'll eat, drink it all the time. Um, and I mean, that might be a brewer thing, but, uh, it's just, I think that the, the constant new releases is a new thing for me. Yeah. Um, so as you've grown as a brewer, um, are there certain resources, groups, or even books that you've really kind of relied on to help you along the way? Um, definitely all of the publications from the Brewers Association, um, all of the books that they put out and that they have like on their, their online library are awesome. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now and it's going to be terrible, but the Practical Brewers Handbook, it's mm -hmm. basically the Brewers Bible. Um, that one I've read multiple times and I will refer to it all the time. Like the technical type of a th type of things, like there's a lot new equip of new equipment that is obviously not, that book was written I think the 80s or the early 90s. And so a lot of the equipment that has come out since then is not, but the concept, like the fermentation hasn't changed yeah. in, you know, hundreds of years. So that's all the same. It's just kind of the way the equipment we use to do it. That, that, so that book I look back at all the time. Um, other brewers, there's just fellow brewers are a really great resource. Um, I've gotten to, I've gotten to go to the craft brewers conference the last two years and the seminars have been really awesome. I, and then what's nice is if you go to the conference, then you get all of the recordings of all the seminars. So I kind of, when I'm 
mapping out my agenda for the conference. You can't go to everything because they all happen at the same time. So I just like make, I make a list of everything that I'm going to listen to, everything that I'm going to go to, and then everything that I'm going to listen to afterwards. Um, and but yeah, fellow brewers are a really great help. Um, I've been super lucky to have two really great mentors from Doug Hasker at Gordon Beers and Marty Mendiola from Rock Bottom, and then the other brewers within that company. It was really great. I miss it a little bit. I still have a lot of contacts over there, but it was really nice. I could just, you know, do a group email to like, it was DL all brewers, and I could just be like, hey, this is happening. Has anybody else done this or had to deal with this? And some of the brewers who've been with that company have been with the company 25 plus years. They've been brewing for 25 plus years. The amount of information and knowledge that they all have has been amazing for me. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the brewing industry as a whole, um, where do you kind of see it trending in the next five or 10 years? Like, where do you think it's going? Uh, I definitely think we're going to stick on the hyper-local trend. Um, I'm really liking what's available out here in North Carolina because there are so many more like malting companies and farming areas that you can get some really great local ingredients. Hops pretty much are only done in the North, the Pacific Northwest because that's just their happy place. Um, it's really hard to grow those outside of anywhere else, but the amount of malting companies that are out in North Carolina has been really cool for me. I only know of a couple in California that are starting to pop up, um, but I definitely think we're moving away from the, you know, national craft breweries mm -hmm. like your Sierra Nevadas, your New Belgiums. It's really hard to get to that point now if you're not already there because everybody's like, you know, I want my beer that's from my city. I don't want your beer that's from Chico. Like, I want, you know, this is what I want. So I think it's gonna be more, a lot more craft breweries that are kind of regional, maybe like, you know, the Carolinas and Virginia and Tennessee, like that kind of area versus somebody that's gonna be across the whole US. Yeah, yeah. That makes complete sense. So speaking about kind of hyper local, thinking about Bold Missy, what do you see as kind of the mission for Bold Missy? For me, um, I think, you know, we all have our own interpretations right. of Bold Missy. Uh, for me, it's, you know, it's a celebration of women and it's a celebration of beer. And it's really being a, a comfortable environment for women to come in and try beer and try different beers. I like to try and have lots of different styles on um, and so that we have kind of a beer for everybody. So people come in, I've had so many women that are friends, they're just like, I just don't like beer. And I'm like, well, don't say that. Like, try just every, no matter what, like, just keep trying beer. If you just, you continue to not find anything, that's fine. Maybe beer is just not for you. Everybody has their own palate. Um, drink what you like. Beer for me is supposed to be fun and relaxing and I get really annoyed when people are like I'll go to beer festivals and like women will come up to my booth and they're just like I'm really trying to like IPAs. I'm like why are you trying to do anything? It's beer. <laughs> like just drink what you like. If you like sours, if you like dark beers. Like my grandmother she cracks me up because every time she would come and visit us at the pub and I would have lunch with her and my mom and she would get tasters of her one of her favorite beers of mine was my bourbon barrel age imperial stout and she yeah <laughs> grandma liked to drink um, <laughs> but she would only get these little four ounce tasters she liked the little glass so but she'd get like three during lunch and i'm like grandma why don't you just get a glass it's the same amount of beer and she's like i just like the little glasses i'm like oh, okay you do you grandma <laughs> um so uh, for me, it just, Bull Missy, ha it's a very comfortable environment and being able to have people come in and just be able to try stuff and not feel like they're going to be judged or kind of shamed for like, oh, you want to drink this? Like, you should really be drinking this kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the system that you guys have here? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have a 15 barrel, uh, two, uh, two tank uh, brew house. Um, mash louder tin and then 15 barrel kettle um, and it's from uh, practical fusion made in Oregon um, and then we've got four 15 barrel fermenters and four 15 barrel bright tanks um, 
which allows me to be able to crank out a good amount of beer pretty quickly. And then we are set, our foundation is poured and set up for two more rows of tanks. So we're thinking probably by the end of this year um, or into like, you know, the first, second quarter of next year, getting a 30 barrel tank with a 30, bar 30 barrel fermenter with a 30 barrel bright tank so that we can do some double batches. Um, kind of take a little bit of the load off yeah. so that we can do a little bit more at once. Uh, which are y'all doing any barrel aging here yet? We are. So we've got um, six Woodford Reserve barrel, bourbon barrels. Uh, four of those have our Conquer the Route chocolate stout, and then two of them have the Solo Flight brown ale. And then we also just recently got two California red wine barrels that I put our Belgian triple in, which I'm really excited about. That one we're gonna release and do a bottle release in November. That one I'm really excited about. That sounds delicious. Yeah. So there probably isn't one, but can you talk about a typical day <laughs> around the brewery? Um, yeah, so usually, um, so if it's a brew day, um, I've started, <clears throat> coming in <clears throat> coming in a little bit earlier because my little Southern California body is not so used to this humidity, <laughs> um, the heat and the humidity. So I'm kind of going back to my uh, Gordon Beersh early morning root, uh, roots and coming in at like 4, 4.30. That way I'm like finishing up around two um, just because it just gets so hot back there. There is no AC in the brewery. <laughs> and then it's like, that's not so bad until you start boiling things. <laughs> Once you start boiling things and you're up on that platform, it gets real hot real fast. Uh, so I've been starting to come in a little bit earlier for that. So brew day is usually between eight and 10 hours. It's, you know, I usually get my grain all together the day before so that I'm ready to roll like right when I get in in the morning, make sure both my hot and cold liquor tanks are full. And then, um, yeah, mash in, go through, I don't have to go through the whole brewing process, but, um, you know, do the whole brew, get it over into my fermenter, make sure my yeast is happy. Um, and then, you know, I'll kind of look into other things. I'm constantly during the day, you know, making sure our keg store, like our keg cooler is filled with all of the different beers that we need. Um, looking at my schedule for, you know, it, it's always the juggling act between, okay, I need this beer by this date, but I have this, these beers in the fermenters and I have these beers in the bright tanks, but I have this many kegs. So which tank can I keg off all of it so that I can move this beer here and I can get this fermenter open. It's definitely all of the juggling and multitasking and yeah. scheduling. But that's one of the things that I like that I've been able to pull from my accounting and finance background is I love Excel. Microsoft Excel is probably my favorite program to ever be invented ever. So I have all of these different Excel spreadsheets that are tracking usage and you know how much we're going through daily, how much we're going through weekly, when I need to brew things, that kind of thing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty detailed system. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of talked about the process, but can you talk a little bit about like your brewing philosophy, how you come up with recipes even. It's kind of changed a little bit since coming over to Bull Mizzy. Initially, I would f start with either, you know, a malt or a hop or an adjunct that I wanted to use or looking at like a traditional style or kind of a hybrid style that I wanted to do and kind of go from there. Like I taste, I'm constantly tasting new malts and uh, whenever my rep comes through, I was like, okay, what do you got that's new? What's different? What are people doing? Um, and kind of tasting different things, smelling different things. Um, so I know what everything tastes like and I can have, I have this idea in my head of like, if I use this much of this and this much of this, when I put it together and I ferment it with this yeast, I know kind of what it's gonna come out of it. Um, and I kind of have to do that because I was never a home brewer. Mm -hmm. So I started on our 25 barrel system and then went to an eight barrel system. So the smallest batch that I've ever made is I think like six barrels. So I tried home brewing a couple times. It did not turn out well. So I stopped doing that. Um, it was kind of just embarrassing. Um, so I just stick to big batches. But for me to be able to do that and not have a pilot system to test out recipes, I really need to know my ingredients and what I do. Um, but so that's what I used to do. And I still do that. But for some of them, like now when we're like, OK, we don't necessarily have a beer that we want to do, but we have a bold Missy that we want to make a beer for this badass woman. And I'm like, OK, well, 
I don't know what kind of style of beer I want to do, but what does that bold Missy speak to me? And so we just recently did this with our Trapper Keeper, which was brewed for Lisa Frank. And I'm a 90s kid and I had everything Lisa Frank when I was a kid. So I'm just like, okay, to me, she's bright colors and fun and fruity and just, she's just this amazing human being that, you know, made all of our 90s dreams come true with Technicolor animals and sparkles, <laughs> um, hence the glitter. Uh, so for that beer, I was just like, okay, what's, you know, light and fruity and bright, Saison. And then I was like, okay, well, what am I gonna put in it? And I was like, I've done um, a, a Saison with Tangelo and pink peppercorn before. And I was like, oh, pink peppercorn for sure. So I did, I was like, okay, pink peppercorn and, you know, pink and yellow were a lot in a lot of her uh, designs. So I was like, okay, pink peppercorn and lemon Saison. And then we're like, okay, well, I'd done a couple beers with edible glitter before. And so kind of like what better purse bold Missy to put edible glitter in a beer for than Lisa Frank. So, yeah. And then, so that's kind of how that came about. So now that kind of who we're naming these beers for comes into my recipe formulation, which sounds so strange, but that's kind of how that came about. Yeah. But it helps reflect the women mm -hmm. better. Exactly. Too. Yeah. And um, like, do, do you help pick the bold missies that are honored? Um, I do. One of the great things about like when I was like interviewing for this job, I was like, I'm terrible at naming beers. There was one back at Rock Bottom, like they let me name the beers whatever I wanted and I would have such a hard time doing it because I know which recipes I want to make. I can, I have a million beer recipes in my head and beers that I want to do, but naming them I'm terrible at. And one of the ones that I just, that I did before I left Rock Bottom was a IPL, an India Pale Lager. And I had no idea what to name it. So I was just like, mm, Hoppy Llama. <laughs> and, like, and everybody's like, what? I'm like, Hoppy Llama. And it was like, they're like, okay. And so, that beer was the I Hoppy Llama IPL. And so that's been really nice here is we have a really great staff that's really great with coming up with names and coming up with bold missies and everything. It's been a really cool, fun. It's a very collaborative effort when it comes to naming things. Yeah. So do you, does Bold Missy have a signature beer or are there particular beers that stand out to you as kind of the ones that are your best showcase? Um, our core beers, we've got um, our Golden, which is the Get Your Gun Golden, named for Annie Oakley. Then we've got the Find A Way Wheat, which is probably one of our best selling beers. It's our Tangerine Belgian Wit. Um, that one is named for Diana Nyad. And then we've got the uh, the Rocket Ride IPA, which is a traditional American IPA, and that same for Sally Ride. Um, we've got our now, it was originally an American brown ale, but I changed it to an English brown ale because English brown ale beers are my favorites. And I've been working on my recipe for English brown ales for like the last three years. And so I, when I interviewed with him, I told him, I was like, okay, like everything's great. I love that you guys have a brown ale in your core beers but it's going to be a, I'm going to have to hard pass if we can't change this to an English brown ale because I hate American brown ales and it's like not something that I can get over. And they're just like, oh, okay. I'm like, wow. <laughs> like she's weird. Like she's, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm probably the only person who has such a strong like opinion on brown ales. <laughs> Um, but so, but luckily I had some of it with me and they tried it and like, oh, this is really good. I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah. Brownies. Yeah. Um, so then the, like that was fine. And so, but our solo flight English brown ale is named for Amelia Earhart. Um, that's definitely my favorite, my baby. Um, and then we've got a chocolate stout named for Alison Levine. So it's, those are our core beers. Um, definitely our best-selling beer um, would be the Find Away Tangerine Wheat, which I'm yeah. really happy with how it's turned out now. Uh, originally, it was done with a lot of extract, and I hate extract in beer. For me, it's just a very overwhelming, it starts to not, no, no, depending on how you use it, it starts to no longer taste like beer, it's more candy-like. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've changed it to being all natural tangerine flavor. So I put tangerine peel, dried tangerine peel into the whirlpool on the hot side. And then um, I've sourced tangerine puree 
uh, from Oregon fruit products that we put in on the cold side. And we've got this really, now really great kind of balance between aroma and flavor going from the hot side and the cold side, and it's a really natural tangerine flavor. It still tastes like beer. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned this a couple of times with the brown and mm -hmm. the tangerine process, but are there other examples you can think of of ways that when you came in, you kind of put your stamp on things? Um, I changed uh, a lot of the, the recipes, just kind of cleaned them up a little bit. Um, for me, my I think one of my brewing styles would be simple is better simpler the simpler the better the you don't need to kind of throw you know three percent of this and four percent of this and you know six percent of this like you can get a good clean beer with minimal malts and kind of just simplifying things so I did a lot of that with the recipe and recipes and then I also uh, changed some of the recipes to kind of go back to what they were supposed to be. Um, our uh, Rocket Ride IPA, uh, Bell's Too Hearted is one of Carol's favorite beers. And she really wanted that to be kind of in that realm. And the hops that were being used for it were not exactly what Bell's Too Hearted is. And so we kind of shifted more back towards the traditional American IPA hops and Kind of clean that one up a little bit stuff like that yeah. just little little tweaks here and there yeah styles other than the english brown ale styles all stayed the same yeah <laughs> but you had to draw the line somewhere. i had to draw, i had to draw the line on that one <laughs> so what is your favorite part of brewing the whole brewing process oh. from recipe development to someone drinks your beer what's your favorite part um i love the organization of it uh, I love the organization and how like systematic it is. Um, one of the things that I think I say all the time that brought me into brewing is as a kid and even now still, I love to bake because I'm a little OCD, like not super OCD, like clicking things all the time, but it's I like putting this amount of this and this amount of this at this temperature for this amount of time and you get this product every time. I love that the organization of that. Um, I love talking to people about beer. Um, I'm pretty introverted, but until it comes to beer. Like, if I'm talking about beer, I can talk to anybody. But as long as I don't have to talk about anything else than beer. Um, but, yeah, I love, I love having people try the beer and having people like it. I love having something on that people are just like, oh, I don't think I'm going to like that. I'm like, just try it. It's a free taster. Come on. It's not going to hurt you. And then they're like, oh, wow. I really like that, especially with brown ales. I feel like brown ales are like the unsung heroes of the multi beer world, and uh, and so getting people to like different things or taste different things is always really fun. Yeah. So, what about your least favorite part? Um. Waking up at five thirty. Oh no, that's fine. <laughs> um, let's see. What's my least favorite thing? Um. Also, talking to people about beer. <laughs> Um, it's kind of a love-hate relationship with me. When I first got into brewing, brewers were still kind of back-of-house mm -hmm. jobs. And with the rise in social media and everybody who, like, wanted, like, celebrity chefs, like, now it's, like, brewers are, like, oh, well, we got to know, who, do you know your brewer? Like, and all that kind of thing. And I was, like, when I got into it, that wasn't really a thing. Yeah. And so now it's very much that way. So I kind of had to like shift because I was like, okay, well, I've already fallen in love with brewing, so now I just got to figure out this side of it. Um, so that took me a little while to adjust to, and I'm still kind of adjusting to it, especially coming into a new city. Back in San Diego, I knew everybody, and it was fine. Like I, it wasn't, I wasn't constantly getting introduced to people, and now it's like I'll have. I had someone come up to me the other day at like a beer festival. I was working. I worked Moo and Brew beer festival, and someone came up to me. And they're like, "Aren't you the brewer?" I was like, "Yes." And they're like, "Why are you working beer festivals?" I was like, "Well, I like talking to you guys, kind of a thing." And I'm like, "Oh shoot, now people recognize me, <laughs> kind of a thing." Um, so yeah, it's definitely a love hate relationship with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I like talking to people about beer. I just don't like being the focus of that talk. If that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. So thinking here about Bold Missy, um, what are your kind of hopes and dreams for the next 
for the growth of Ole Miss year changes even? Or how do you see it going in um, few years? I definitely want some more tanks. <laughs> um, more tanks, more beer. Um, I definitely see us, you know, building our footprint in Charlotte. Um, I think Carol and I are very much on the same page with, you know, we don't want to become too big. Um, mm -hmm. We want to be the, a local, like a local hangout, local, regional type of brewery. And uh, I'd love to, once we get more tanks, start doing some canning of our beers because uh, I love our logos. Our logos make me so happy and I think that they would just kind of rock on cans. And uh, I just love, I want Bull Missy to do well because I love our story and I love our mission. And I think one of the things that you know Bull Missy is doing well is we're celebrating women and we are you know using women on our labels in a tasteful, classy way. Um, and I think that's definitely kind of in the forefront of what's being talked about. And I think once we're able to get a lot of our logos out there and people can see like, oh this is how you do it like this is the better way to do it you can still put women on your label you can still you know do it in a proper way and i think i really like that to kind of get out in the market for people to see that yeah is there a particular style you're looking forward to brewing once you get your new barrels that you haven't had a chance to mm, play around with yet let's see. i love pale ales especially like west coast pale ales <laughs> it's so bad it's the expected um, West Coast right answer. Yes, <laughs> yes. Because, um, you know, or hop forward, but a little bit of malt. Because um, I'm not a huge fan of like session IPAs. Session IPAs sometimes tend to be a little bit too thin for me. You need to have the malt to carry those extra hops through. So that's why I'm, I'm more on the West Coast pale ale end of those things. And. I guess just more hoppy beers. I think that's kind of where the market is going, but we also want to have a wide variety for everybody. But I think kind of the market, you got to have like three or four hoppy beers on at a time. So in order to do that and still have all of our other stuff on, um, more hoppy beers. It's such a, such a West Coast answer. <laughs> more hops. It's not a bad answer though. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I just like doing lots of different things. Um, what was the beer that I was thinking of brewing? I can't remember. But yeah, lagers. Oh, I'd love to start making some lagers with more tanks. I just don't have the time to leave a tank, a yeah. beer in a tank for five weeks. I just, we were just pumping through them so fast. I just don't have the time to do that. Uh, I'd love to make some lagers, kind of go back to my Gordon Beerish roots. Yeah. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, Old Missy has its its main mission. Your owner, the owner is a woman. <laughs> Head brewer is a woman. This is not a combination that we come across often, not often. in the craft brewing industry. Yeah. Um, can you talk about kind of that unique position and maybe even some challenges or benefits that you see to that kind of setup? Um, it definitely is an interesting setup. Um, me being in the beer industry is very male dominated industry. It's starting to shift. Um, I'm very used to working with men. I grew up with brothers. I was very much a tomboy growing up. I hated pink and I would only wear dresses if I could wear my sweatpants underneath them. Um, and so kind of coming into this uh, into Bold Missy, it was a little bit of a culture shift for me at work with working with so many women and being around so many women and all the time. So that was a little bit of an adjustment for me. But it, because there's just certain things that you can say to men and it's just, it's, it, they won't read into things. And it was, so I definitely kind of changed how I approached things. I, was just, I'm still very honest about things. I'm just maybe not quite as blunt. Um, and I'll explain myself a little bit better just to make sure that nobody's kind of reading. We're, as women, we, we always just kind of read between the lines sometimes, which makes, we're very intuitive, but sometimes you can try to read too much in between <laughs> the lines. Um, but I think it's really awesome. We've been 
I think everybody thinks it's really cool and I love for people to kind of see that, you know, there's a lot of breweries that are women owned, but like it's owned with their husbands mm -hmm. or, you know, it's male brewers and um, that kind of thing, or it's male owned and a female brewer or that kind of thing. So it's really cool, I think, for people to see that, you know, you can do everything. You can own the brewery, you can be the head brewer, like you don't need to, it's not a gender role. Mm -hmm. And I think that's cool for people to see that, you know, not just guys are brewers, it's, you know, anybody can be a brewer. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of thing. I think we're more open to different things. Like, you know, I'll come to them and we're like, I want to do this with the beer. And they're just like, okay, Carly, <laughs> like you do you. <laughs> as long as it turns out, okay, we're fine. Um, especially when it came to, you know, putting glitter. They're like, really? Glitter? I'm like, but it's Lisa Frank. Come on, guys. <laughs> There's got to be glitter for yeah, Lisa Frank. Yeah. And so, and then like, as soon as I like kind of showed them, they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. So um, I know that a local Pink Boots group mm -hmm. here has recently started. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so I was our I was a Pink Boots co chapter leader back in San Diego uh, when I was part of a brew pub that was in a production brewery, and I also had an assistant over there. Uh, so currently, um, I was helpful in showing that we needed. A Charlotte, Charlotte chapter of mm -hmm. Pink Boots um, because it's just it's way too hard during the work week or on weekends traveling two to three hours to get to a Pink Boots meeting and I think one of the greatest things about Pink Boots is the education and the networking between women uh, that I mean that's why they started it like Terry Farendorf she didn't even know that there were other women who worked in the beer industry and uh, Laura Ulrich who's the president of Pink Boots is one of my really good friends from back in San Diego and that is kind of the greatest part about it is being able to talk to other women and you know like say you had an issue I had an issue with this thing and like you know the guys told me to do it this way but that doesn't work for me like how do you guys deal with it there's just different stuff that we run into as women that the guys just don't deal with and not to say that you can't do it you just have to figure out the right way for you to do it and when you know you're having not not monthly meetings and they're three hours away we had so many women in Charlotte that didn't even know that Pink Boots was a thing and so I was trying to talk to the uh, Pink Boots North Carolina women like hey we need a city chapter and one of their big things was like well we don't want to have city chapters because it divides us and I'm like we need to have city chapters we can have one North Carolina Pink Boots but we need city chapters because we need these women to be meeting more regularly than once a year because some of the women don't see the other women except for Beer to Femme every year and Beer to Femme is awesome but it's a beer festival it's so crazy you don't really get to get that feeling of camaraderie and friendship that you get when you meet with people that live in your city you know multiple times a year yeah so I think I was helpful in explaining what the benefits of having city chapters are and like now I think we're there's like going to be a Winston-Salem chapter and I, I love that we're expanding into these city chapters so that the women can get more time together um, and uh, but I'm not don't have I had Lori had to give me some tough love she's like Carly you do not have time to be a chapter leader because <laughs> I was originally telling them I was like yeah I'll be a chapter I've done it before I know the whole I know all of our like programs and everything and they, Laura just had to t sit me down and be like Carly you do not have time to do this <laughs> I was like you're probably right <laughs> so um, I told the girls that um, Jordan Boynest and Rita Welder are the ones who are going to be running the Charlotte chapter and I just told him, I was like, you know, whatever you need me for, like, I can help you. Like, I know how to use all of the programs. I just can't do it. <laughs> but, but, and so it was, it's been good. I'm really excited that Charlotte is now having a chapter. Um, and I'm really excited about, you know, Beard of Femme and the whole North Carolina Pink Boot Society chapters. Um, but it's, it's really awesome. About how many women do you think are in the Charlotte group? Ooh, um, I'd probably say maybe like, 25 oh, to wow. 30 maybe they just had a meeting that I had to miss <laughs> and 
and it was like our first meeting and I got teased for it I'm like, oh, you know it's Sunday <laughs> um, and uh, but we had about maybe 15 to 20 women who came in for our pink boots brew which was so much fun and super awesome and you guys did that here mm -hmm. yep we did it here um, we did we did it we named it for our bold missy was Queen Charlotte <laughs> Charlotte um, and we did it we named it long live the QC and what kind of it beer was, was it? It was a hazy IPA. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was my first hazy IPA, and I was just like, well, it's a collaboration. I need to take in the input of the local people. Um, and the hot blend that uh, YCH put together for Pink Boot Society, which raised almost $30,000 for Pink Boots, because a portion of the proceeds of the hop sales went to Pink Boots, and then everybody who brewed beer with those hops, then donated a portion of sales. So it was awesome. It was like mm. doubled the amount of uh, donations that Pink Boots got. But the hop blend, it was Mosaic, Citra, Laurel, Palisade. It was just screaming for an IPA. So it had to be an IPA. And then, you know, kind of pulling in the East Coast, I was like, all right, I guess it'll be hoppy. Yeah. <laughs> or hazy. Yeah. So, you know. A little bit of both. A little bit of both, so. So if you had, uh you know, a young woman walk in here right now who said, when I grow up, I want to be a brewer. What advice would you give her? Um, take plumbing and mechanics <laughs> and engineering and electrical, because <laughs> as a brewer, you do about 5% of your day is spent brewing. Um, and most of the day it's fixing stuff and, <laughs> and plumbing. And I'm constantly working on my, like, you know, I've finally got all of them working, but like my temperature, pro like my temperature controllers for all of my tanks, like getting those all dialed in and, you know, plumbing all the time. Uh, and, but yeah, I mean, just find some, like read all the books, learn all of the things you can. Um, instead, like I, I love that my path that I went on, cause it got me to where I am right now. And I know that I wouldn't be where I am without being where I've been. But, you know, not having those student loans for that degree I'm not using would be real nice. Um, but it's definitely, you know, you don't have to do the traditional route. You don't need to do a four-year degree and go to college. Like, there is a huge need for, you know, tradespeople and makers. We need people that are making things. Um, so looking into those types of things um, and not just kind of going with the flow and, you know, doing what is expected. Yeah. So thinking about kind of the North Carolina scene, and you haven't been here in North Carolina for too long. Six months, like three days ago. <laughs> but do you have a favorite part of kind of the North Carolina beer scene? Like, is there something about North Carolina that stands out as a favorite piece to you? Mm, I think one of the things that I'm really digging and is the, the hyper locality of it, mm -hmm. like a lot of like, I was able to get get you know, you know two gallon two five gallon buckets of honey with like eighty pounds of honey, um, from uh, this really cute local little man like honey farmer. I don't know what to call, <laughs> what would you call a honey farmer like beekeeper, um, and so like that kind of thing. There's I think three or four different malting companies that are just in North Carolina and they get their their barley from the local their farmers that are in their areas. Um, I love um, Free Range Brewing Company just down the street in um, Noda because they do like all local stuff. They've got their farmers that they get all of their herbs from for their saisons and you know uh, adding all of their different spices and seasonings to their beers. I think that's really really awesome. Um, I think, yeah, that's definitely been one of the coolest things about coming out here and seeing what is available for, you know, getting from your, pulling from your local community. Yeah, so the local ag really kind mm -hmm. of plays into yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so do you have a favorite North Carolina beer? Have you found a favorite yet? Mm -hmm. Or do you have a favorite today? Um, a favorite that's not mine. That's not yours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, 
There aren't a lot of English browns. No, there are not a lot of English browns. <laughs> um, I do uh, the bird song Paradise City is that's their session IPA. I think mm -hmm. I really like that beer. Um, I haven't had it in a while. Um, I really liked some stuff that was brought to me from uh, Ponysaurus and in Durham. In Durham, yeah. Um, and then I really liked um, the beer from. Oh, no, uh, Southern Pines. Um, I really like some of the stuff that I got from them, which has been really awesome. Um, I'm really trying to get out and go and visit new places. I'm excited. I'm going up to Asheville for the day in a couple weeks, and I'm gonna like try and like putz around and see a bunch of stuff and um, that kind of thing. But I have been so busy here. I'm really excited about getting an assistant because now I can actually like take the time to go like other places. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that'll be exciting. Yeah. Um, so is the English brown your favorite that you do here? Or do you do you have Depends another favorite? Depends on my mood. So yeah. then there's also my West Coast IPA, the Surf Star, which is mosaic, citra, clean malt, like super clean, simple malt bill. Um, uh, so that one's definitely, I mean, it's really hard. I always call like mosaic and citra the cheater hops. It's like you can't go wrong with mosaic and citra. I mean, unless you... Those hops would probably, well, Citra would not do very well in a black IPA. Mosaic would be okay, but, mm, but yeah. So those hops are super easy, um, but I, yeah, I love that beer. Um, definitely not sours, although the sours have been very popular, those just not my jam. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you haven't had much time to have free time lately, <laughs> but on those rare occasions yeah. when you do. What do you like to do when you're not? Camping, I love camping. Um, that was one of the things that I was really excited about moving out here. Um, I got a new truck um, a couple years ago and it was a used truck and it just happened to come with a camper shell. And before my truck that I have now, I was always super against camper shells because I only ever saw them on like my dad's old F-150 that was like a long bed and like not a double cab. So it to me, it always looked like a hearse. <laughs> And it was black. And I was like, that's a hearse dad. Like, no. So, but then because mine's a double cab and it like and it's a short bed, it looks makes it look more like an SUV and it has made camping even easier because all I have to do is roll up and I just sleep in the back. And so it's one of the things that I love to do with my dog. Like we just go camping and that kind of thing. So I'm definitely really, I'm going camping in a couple weeks, like after Asheville. So I'm super excited about to start doing that kind of stuff. Uh, my roommate has a boat, so we go boating a lot, which is nice. I spend more time in the water. Granted, it's not the ocean, but I spend more time in the water out here than I did like the last five years in San Diego. So it's like, yeah. fun. That is fun. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much the last of my questions. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted, you know, to talk about today? Um, I can't think of anything. Yeah. We hit pink boots. We hit beer. We hit, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank cool. you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks.